people say, you know, what are you afraid of? You know, you must not have fear. That's Colin O'Brady, professional endurance athlete, four-time world record holder, and the first person to complete a solo, unassisted trip across Antarctica. I actually have all sorts of fears, but my biggest fear is really in not living, in not living the full totality of life's experience. I'm Michael Mogul, founder and CEO of Crisp Video, the nation's number one law firm growth company. I built my business through practice, not theory. Crisp started with just $500 to my name and has grown to over eight figures in revenue over the last few years, earning a spot on the Inc. 500 list of the fastest growing private companies in America. Our approach has been to take everything we've learned about generating massive growth within our own organization and help the country's most ambitious and committed law firm owners do the same for theirs. In each episode of this podcast, I sit down with innovative market leaders from the legal industry and beyond to learn from those who thrive in the face of adversity, challenge the status quo, and define what it means to be a true game changer. I sat down with Colin O'Brady to discuss why we all have the power to rewrite our own narratives, how to find the courage to face your fears and overcome any obstacle that stands in your way, and the importance of embracing both zone one days and zone 10 days. I've some come to think about life sort of on a spectrum of one to 10, you know, one being the worst day of our entire life and 10 being, you know, the, the highest, you know, beautiful, most beautiful day, the day your first child is born or some, you know, really high peak moment of your life. But I think too often, certainly in, in Western culture, we actually end up in this zone of comfortable complacency. So rather than thinking about one to 10 in a linear plane, I kind of think about it as a parabola or a pendulum swinging back and forth, which is I've realized to experience experience the tens, you also need to embrace the ones. You also need to put yourself in challenging circumstances. That's coming up on the Game Changing Attorney Podcast. Colin O'Brady is one of the most ambitious people on the planet. He set numerous world records, including the fastest time for completing the seven summits, climbing the highest mountains on every continent. He's also a world-renowned speaker and the best-selling author of The Impossible First, where he chronicled his experience completing the first solo, unassisted trip across Antarctica. I began our conversation by asking Colin about his upbringing and the environment that molded him to become the competitive and high-achieving person he is today. You know, I was uh, born into this world in a somewhat untraditional way. I was, uh, my parents were pretty young, hippie parents. I was born on an organic farm, hippie commune in Olympia, Washington, actually, uh, born at home. Uh, so my mother invited 30 of her closest friends over to watch me be born on a futon on a hippie commune while they're all sitting around uh, hang, hanging out. So uh, my mom played Bob Marley Redemption song on repeat throughout my birth. So I'd say I came into this world in a somewhat untraditional way. Um, I was born in Olympia but moved to Portland, Oregon. And that's really where I grew up. My parents were involved in the, the health food kind of early on the cutting edge of sort of health food, you know, natural food industry, and ultimately were entrepreneurs. Um, and they uh, started a chain of natural foods grocery stores in the Pacific Northwest. So I'd say uh, the hippie upbringing combined with watching my parents, you know, go from young people to successful entrepreneurs is that was our kind of dinner table conversation around, you know, aspirational goal setting dreams, uh, et cetera, definitely a, a fundamental part of my upbringing. Now, I hear there was like a pivotal moment in your childhood. I think you were like seven years old. Um, you were watching the Olympics and then you became obsessed with the Olympics. Yeah, that's right. You know, I uh, didn't have a lot of money when I was a kid, but I was watching the the Barcelona Olympics in 92. So yeah, I was seven years old then. And uh, a swimmer by the name of Pablo Morales uh, won the 100 butterfly gold medal. And for whatever reason, that moment's just so deeply imprinted in my mind. My mom says I was running around the living room, jumping around the couch, you know, and talking about the Olympics. And my mother, you know, huge, huge influence in my life, um, incredibly positive influence. Uh, like I said, like, Spain was like a foreign place to me. I barely traveled outside the state of Oregon. Um, you know, we, we didn't have a lot of money when I was a kid, but my mom just looked at me and she goes, do you want to make the Olympics one day? And I was like, oh my God, yes. And she was like, you know, she got out the calendar and started being like, okay, well you're seven. Like what's the average age of an Olympic swimmer? You know, what, what Olympics might that be? Is that 2012? Is that 2016? So it was just, it was just cool. Like my mom was willing to allow me, you know, to dream as big as possible now that I've, you know, crossed Antarctica 
solo and climbed Everest a couple of times and did these, you know, wild out there adventures, people often ask my mother, oh my God, how does it feel like as a mother, you must be so afraid. And she always kind of jokes with a coy smile and says, you know, careful what you wish for when you tell your kids their whole life they can do anything they set their minds to. Because of course she's, you know, proud of me, but also, you know, she worries about me, some of the things I do. Uh, so there's a fine balance, but she certainly instilled that confidence in me in a young age. Now, I'm curious. I mean, obviously, Colin, you would go on to do these incredible things, incredible feats, but was there any point in your childhood, I mean, could you ever have imagined like what you would go on to do? Were there any kind of indicators or did you feel that either you had greatness inside you or did you even surprise yourself? Yeah, no, that's an interesting question. You know, I think that I always, you know, had a a degree of confidence, um, but certainly I wasn't sitting around as a kid dreaming of, you know, walking by myself for a thousand miles across Antarctica. Uh, that came later. Um, but I think it's built on the build on the back of, of different successes and certainly ups and downs. Uh, also, also tragedy. You know, when I was 22 years old, just graduated from college, you know, again, still hadn't really seen much of the world at that point. And I was been painting houses as a kid. Um, and I decided to go on a backpack trip uh, around the world. And it was an amazing experience. I had no money. I was hitching hiking around and sleeping in youth hostels and whatnot. And I found myself on a beach in rural Thailand. And uh, in that moment, my life changed. You know, there was some guys jumping a flaming jump rope. I was 22 years old at the time, maybe not a fully formed prefrontal cortex. And I decided flaming jump roping looked like some fun, which, which it was for an instant, uh, up until the rope wrapped around my legs, excess kerosene sprayed the length of my body and lit me on fire to my neck. Uh, and I had to jump in the ocean to extinguish the flames, which saved my life, but not before about 25% of my body uh, was severely burned. Um, you know, and as a young person, it was devastating but it was compounded by the fact that I was in the middle of nowhere. You know, I'm in Thailand. Um, I'm on a tiny little island. Instead of an ambulance ride, I had a moped ride down a dirt path to a one-room nursing station. And I'll never forget the, the eight surgeries I underwent there. I never forget the, the cat running around and across my chest in this makeshift ICU. I mean, I was in a bad place. But the worst part about it, you were kind of talking about triggers uh, of mindset and growth, which was probably the most emotionally devastating time in my life is a doctor looks me square in the eyes and he says, Hey, Colin, you will probably never walk again normally, which took the physical pain uh, to another level because the emotional devastation of that was immense. But, you know, we're speaking of my mother and her influential uh, influence on me as a young person. You know, she came into my hospital room. She flew across the world to find me. And I'm there. You know, I know now how freaked out she was. I'm sure many people listening are parents. You know, she's a mother. She's looking at her kids, bandaged from the waist down in this shack of a hospital, unsanitary, screaming, writhing in pain, and being told he'll never walk again normally. But somehow she walks in with this air of positivity and grace and positive energy into that hospital room. And she says to me, I know you're in a bad place, Colin. Like, this is horrible. Like, I'm not going to try to hide from the, the fear of this. But I want you to do something for me. Close your eyes and visualize yourself in the future. You know, picture a positive outcome. Now, your, your question is, I didn't picture myself, like, again, walking across Antarctica or climbing these mountains or whatnot. But I closed my eyes and I pictured myself crossing the finish line of a triathlon. Um, which is not something I'd ever done before. I was a collegiate swimmer at Yale. Um, so I have a swimming background, but never biked or run or anything like that competitively. Um, and I said, look, I can see myself crossing the finish line of a triathlon. And the next moment I think is probably one of the most fundamental uh, shifting moments in my entire life because my mom had a choice. She's looking at me. She's looking at a diagnosis. She's looking at me bandaged legs. And she easily could have said, yeah, I said set a goal, but like maybe something more mm, realistic, like you can't walk. But instead, she didn't do that. She grabbed me tight, hold me close like a mother. And she says, great, I believe in you. I believe that you're going to make that visualization uh, a reality in your life. And, you know, kind of fast forward, it was a, a few months till I was taken out of that Thai hospital Still hadn't taken a single step, carried on and off the plane, uh, placed in a wheelchair when I got home. And my mother, she grabbed a chair from our kitchen table and placed it one step in front of my wheelchair. And she says, look, you need to take your first step. And so it was a couple of hours staring at this wheel, at this chair in front of me. Well, from my wheelchair, you know, legs are still kind of bleeding, bandaged, bruised, very fragile. But I took that first step. And that was when my mom said, look, you just took your first step on your road to racing this triathlon. I mean, it seems minuscule. I'm like standing from one chair to the other chair, but that was the beginning. And then 18 months later, I finally did take a job in Chicago as a commodities trader, wanted to kind of get on with my life. I signed up and raced the Chicago triathlon uh, and I achieved that goal. You know, I finished, I finished that triathlon 18 months after being told I would never walk again normally. And kind of the final 
you know, uh, exclamation point on this story is to my complete and utter surprise. And this is your question. Did I surprise myself? Well, I surprised myself that day, which was, I didn't just finish the race, but I actually won the entire Chicago triathlon placing first out of, you know, nearly 5,000 participants. But I mean, to conclude that thought, it wasn't like, oh, I just patted myself on the back and said, oh, wow, I'm some superhuman athlete. My mind, and this is something I think all of us can apply in our own lives, which is my mind went back to that Thai hospital and wondered what would have happened had my mom not forced me to look towards this future and set a measurable goal. Um, And from that, I think I learned one of my life's most valuable lessons, which is not just me, but all of us, every person listening, yourself, um, we all have reservoirs of untapped potential to achieve extraordinary things. Things, particularly when we can shift our mindset towards the positive and choose how to react um, in tough situations. And so uh, forgive the long rambling answer. Um, but, you know, for me, that was a fundamental turning point where everything that I've built, you know, that was in 2008 when I was burned, you know, so in the last 13 years or so has built, been built off the back of a deep learning, something I had to learn the hard way, literally. But the strength that I've gained from overcoming that obstacle, what my mom instilled in me and finding these reservoirs of strength and courage has definitely pushed me to do the things I've been able to do since then. Now, most people in your situation, I have to imagine, they probably would have given up in that Thai hospital, right? Like what what elements was it? I mean, obviously having your mom there, I think that in itself was, it was amazing to have that support system, someone who believed in you and someone that could encourage you. But I also imagine that like there were moments where you did visualize the, you know, the triathlon, but then the doubt would creep in and thinking, is this crazy? Like, you know, am I ever really going to walk again? And if I do, certainly not going to run a triathlon. What What kept you pushing forward? Look, we all definitely, you know, face that demon. I often say, you know, like when I was in Antarctica, for example, you know, I was out there alone. My goal was to become the first person in history to cross solo, uh, unsupported and completely human powered. And we can talk a little more about this, but directly to your question, there were many days where, you know, I say like, I wasn't alone out there. Unfortunately, I was there uh, myself. And then I was also battling my mind, all of the doubts and the fears. They'd come inside of my tent, literally Colin, you're an idiot. Why did you try this? Colin, it's minus 30 degrees outside. Colin, how the heck did you think you're going to pull a 375 pound sled across this frozen continent? Colin, you're too weak. Colin, you know, all of that, right? We have these moments, you know, that's unfortunately, uh, just a part of the human condition. But I'm a believer that we are the stories that we tell ourselves, that we actually have a choice in how to sort of rewrite that narrative. We can't always completely quiet that, but I try to kind of uh, shout over top of it with positivity. And so every single morning in uh, Antarctica, I would wake up and I would actually shout the words out loud. I'm like, I picture myself alone in the middle of Antarctica, nothing around. I would shout the top of my lungs, Colin, you are strong. You are capable. You are strong. You are capable. And I'm shouting those things out to just kind of override that negativity. So I think, um, you know, along the road to this triathlon, uh, obviously Antarctica came many years after that, but, you know, on the road to this triathlon, it's the same thing. You know, I, I, I was full of these doubts, but I do know that we have the control over that. We get to write the stories that we tell ourselves. And I try to tell myself, you know, as many positive things as I possibly can. I will also say, that our mind, I think, is a muscle, you know, something that we can flex and develop. It's actually not like a fixed state. Um, we can talk more about that. But, you know, really being able to have that control and realize it's us. It's actually within us. Nobody else, no external anything is going to change that. We have the ability to control those thoughts and doubts. And so they are, as they arise, um, I would just stay focused on the positive goal, the incremental steps I can make along the way. Now, it, it's interesting to me because it seems like throughout all of the this just journey, you've had somebody who's been supportive and in your corner. And and even going back to like, you know, that trip around the world, uh, there was a stop, I believe, in Fiji where you met somebody very important to you that would also later come around even after the triathlon and set you up for that next adventure. Yeah, absolutely. So the very serendipitously at the beginning of that trip around the world, this dates me a little bit, but in 2006, when I graduated from college in 2007, when I'd saved up a few thousand dollars to go travel around the world, like I said, it was, wasn't luxurious by any means, but I went into a student travel agency uh, called STA Travel. I don't know if you remember that you used to be able to go into this place and like get a student discount ticket. And the person, literally a person, not a website, a person is uh, doing processing the ticket for me. And they say, hey, you're trying to get to New Zealand, I see. Um, you can actually take a free layover in Fiji. 
Um, I had to like pretty much look it up on the map. I didn't, I'd heard of it, but didn't really know where it was. I was like, oh, Tropical Island. Yeah, sure. I'll stop there for free because I was just trying to travel and see the world. And serendipitously, that was my first stop on this trip around the world. I found myself on this tiny little island, the Sand Atoll. You could walk around the circumference of it in about five minutes. But uh, I guess the, the universe had had something in store for me that day, which is I met my now wife, the, the beautiful Jenna Bisaw. And you know, she was a young college kid uh, on a study abroad program in Australia and I traveled to Fiji for a week and I met her um, and we immediately you know had a deep connection although we only spent a couple of days together it set us in motion of, of what now is a, a beautiful long-standing you know almost 15 year long relationship and a beautiful marriage um, and without a doubt you know I talked a lot about my mother but Jenna you know really has been in my corner since that through through the burn accident in the last 10 years or so, everything we've built, you know, we, we've we we've built and sold companies and had very successful exits. I've set 10 world records, all of which have had, you know, big multi-million dollar documentaries around them or my New York Times bestselling book or, you know, our, our nonprofit efforts with, with kids and inspiring, you know, millions of school kids. Jenna has been foundationally involved with that. You know, I can sometimes say you can only put one name on the cover of the book. It's The Impossible First by Colin O'Brady. But I, I think you've, you've read the book or you know about the book. And it's really both of our stories. You know, um, none of this happens without her love, support, creativity, cunning and business strategy, etc. Um, so it's really been a beautiful thing to, to share with my, you know, my number one person in this world and my wife. And it's been really cool to build and develop it all together. You got to think it takes a unique human being, right? To want to be uh, on this type of journey with you, right? It's funny, we had Tim Grover on the podcast and he talked about the fact that he's like, it's not so much that opposites attract, their goal in life should really be to find somebody as effed up as you are, right? Because <laughs> for the things that you are undergoing, right? And there's times where I imagine she could, you know, she felt maybe she'd lose you, right? Like the, you're putting you know, your life on the line and yet like, what, what, you know, she turned into one of your greatest advocates. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's awesome. You had Tim Grover on the podcast. Uh, I was just reading his book, Winning. Actually, him and I have the the same editor and the same publisher, Scribner. I've never met Tim, but um, we we have work with a lot of the same people. And that book was really cool. But yeah, no, it definitely, I think it, I would agree. I'm smiling uh, for those who can't see me, but that it takes a, a certain certain person. Um, you know, my wife, Jenna, is extraordinary. Actually, early on in her life, before I met her, um, her kind of first love, her high school and early college boyfriend, he died suddenly in a motorcycle accident. And so she, you know, she's actually literally has lived through um, what it feels like to lose uh, a loved one. And, um, you know, Know, obviously, the, the worst thing in the world would be for that to happen to her again. Although in a strange way, she says, you know, you want to call it universe, you want to call it God, you know, whatever your spiritual connection to the greater sense is, that doesn't matter. But she's kind of like, there's no way that the plan for my life was to have that happen twice. Uh, not that she thinks that I'm invisible by any means, um, but she has a, a belief in my sort of decision making, etc. You know, you know, on the first time I was climbing Mount Everest in 2016, I was actually up in a pretty bad storm um, and I was afraid, you know, I was afraid to go up. You know, it's like I had been actually caught out in a storm a few days earlier. Um, people had died on the mountain uh, over the course of that expedition. Not anyone I knew, but we were aware of it. And then it was time for me to go to summit. It was my last chance to go for the summit. And this was part of a world record project called the Explorers Grand Slam, where I was trying to climb the seven summits as well as go to North and South Pole faster than anyone. It was my first big world record project. And we had invested years our time and energy into getting to this point. I was needed Everest and Denali. And I call her on the satellite phone. And I say to her, I'm afraid. I'm at 26,000 feet. That's called the death zone. That's the last camp before the summit of Everest. And it's my only shot now to go for the summit is to go for that night. And the weather forecast is literally saying, you know, it could be good, but it also could turn just like it had a few days earlier. And I got caught in a bad situation. And I was just afraid. I didn't know what to do. And so I've got this crackly sat phone connection. It's cutting in and out. We can barely hear each other. But I said, you know, I, I need you to kind of help me, you know, in this situation. And if she had said, look, Colin, it's not worth it. Calm down. You've done a good job. I'm proud of you. I think I would have listened to her, you know, to be if I'm perfectly honest. But that's not what she did. You know, her strength is unbelievable. Um, and, and she says to me, she goes, Colin, go inside of your body and listen you know, you have trained for this. You're ready. People are going to summit Mount Everest tonight. And I know that you can be one of them. You know, go, I believe in yourself. And that was what I needed to get out of my tent that day at 26,000 feet. And sure enough, that was the first time, you know, I summited Mount Everest. Now, on the flip side of that, 
just earlier this year, I was attempting to be the first uh, person to climb K2, the second tallest mountain in the world uh, in winter, something that had never been done before. And uh, ultimately, a, a team of really uh, talented Nepalese climbers did claim that first ascent. Super proud of them, uh, friends of mine. But I was up there very similar circumstances. I'm at, I'm at the final camp before the summit. It's minus 50 degrees outside. K2 um, has a really high death rate. So 25% of people at summit don't make it back down. And in winter, it had never been done before. Super extreme conditions. Too long of a story to tell, but I basically end up inside of my tent having to make a decision. And a bunch of my friends who I'm with are saying, we're going to go for it. We're going to go for it. We're going to persevere uh, and go for it. And, you know, my kind of whole identity, my brand, so to speak, is built on being the guy that does hard things that no one's done before to persevere. And a very, very similar situation. I pull up my satellite phone and I call home to Jenna. And I say, hey, like, here's the situation. We're a little bit low on supplies. Some people forgot their tents. They're crammed inside of my tent. But, you know, the weather seems okay. You know, what do you think I should do? And if you want to rewind the script of the story, I just tell you, this is the part where Jenna says, go inside your body and listen, Colin, you can do it. But in her intuitive knowing in this moment, she goes, I don't have a read on this. I want to help you, obviously. And I know you're in a very fragile state, but I don't have a read on this. I trust whatever decision you make. And so in this situation, although it looked very similar to the last time, she empowered me to make that decision for myself. And so in this moment, I closed my eyes. You know, this was just February of this past year. So six months ago or so, I closed my eyes and kind of started to listen to that intuitive voice inside of me. I'm crammed in a fetal position in this tent on K2 in the middle of the night in winter, minus 50 degrees, chaos all around me. And I go into this intuitive voice and my friends are saying, we're going for it. We're going for the summit. You know, we could make history, all these things. And I go inside and the voice inside me that day says, back off. It says, actually, th this is... For whatever reason, there's something in the alchemy of this moment to not go forward. And so it was a very tough decision for me. But I told my friends and colleagues, hey, look, you know, I'm not going to go for it. But if you guys want to, you know, have at it, you should go for it. And unfortunately, um, you know, fortunately, I, I turned back and my, I'm alive to tell the tale. Um, unfortunately, five people died on the mountain over the course of that expedition for um, in the course of the following 24 hours. Those folks that did that, that left the tent that night, um, who I knew very well. And so I'm still making heads and tails and sense of that story. But in the context of your question about Jenna is... She's incredibly strong. She's incredibly powerful. She's she's incredibly able to tell me to push forward in really tough circumstances. And she's also willing um, to say, hey, look, Colin, I trust you. I trust you. You're sitting there. Make that decision. She's not pulling me back or pushing me forward, but empowering me to make the right decisions and, and trusting that even though I'm holding not just my own life in my hands, I'm holding both of our lives and our future children in our hands and all this sort of stuff. Um, so we've, we've faced some pretty intense moments together. Together, but it has uh, created the foundation and the fabric of a beautiful uh, and rich depth uh, loving relationship. And I couldn't be more grateful for it. It's the greatest thing in my life for sure. And Colin, are you finding, I'm just curious, like as, as you're growing a little bit older, you're married, you have children in the, in the future, right? So it, are you finding, like, I'm just curious, like how do you balance that, whether it's confidence or hubris of all the things that you've achieved, right? With whatever that next feat is and knowing, okay, how do I approach this in a way where I've still got to make it back? Like, how do you balance that? I don't know if hubris is the word or what, but where do you find, you know, you know where can you draw that line between pushing forward and pulling back? Um, it's a great question. I think that people... Oftentimes, you know, the question, a similar question, it's about fear or risk management or, or things like that. And the truth is, you know, people say, oh, God, this guy walked across Antarctica solo. He's climbed these mountains. He got in a rowboat and rode across Drake Passage, the most dangerous stretch of ocean in the world. This guy must be an adrenaline junkie or something like that. But to be perfectly honest, I really don't see myself uh, in that light at all. I don't think I'm, I'm chasing adrenaline, like a game of Russian roulette that I hope that I keep winning. These are calculated, you know, these are thought out, these are trained. I'm not saying there's not a risk, you know, the risk and the, the tenuous nature of these is what does bring apart some of the richness of the experiences. But at the same time, you know, I, I really do think them through moment to moment, step by step, day by day, and evaluate that. As I've gotten older, I don't think that I'm going to necessarily take on uh, different projects, but I do think that there is at some point a fallacy of, you know, look, I, I've said 10 world records and someone's like, oh, what's the next biggest, hardest 
bigger mountain, further continent, you know, harder way to do X, Y, or Z, um, like the one upmanship of yourself. And I think, you know, at some point that that's a losing game for sure. And so, you know, at this point, I still have all sorts of big dreams out there in the world of exploration and various ways to kind of push my body in unique and interesting ways. But it's not necessarily built on the backs of, you know, what's the most headline catching thing? What's the the hardest thing you could possibly imagine? You know, my, my ego doesn't necessarily, you know, need that. You know, what people say, you know, what are you afraid of? You know, you must not have fear. And I actually have all sorts of fears, but my biggest fear is really in not living and not living the full totality of life's experience. Um, you know, this may resonate with some of your audience or not, but, you know, I've some, come to think about life sort of on a spectrum of one to 10, you know, one being the worst day of our entire life and 10 being, you know, the, the highest, you know, beautiful, most beautiful day, the day your first child is born or some, you know, really high peak moment of your life. But I think too often, certainly in in Western culture, um, at a certain socioeconomic level, we actually end up in this zone of comfortable complacency, you know, this zone between four and six, you know, maybe your boss yells at you at work at one day, but you don't like your job enough. It doesn't really matter. So like, you know, it's a four, but it's definitely not a one. You're like, whatever. I don't really like this job anyways. Or like on the weekends, you're watching a football game with your buddy, drinking a couple beers, your team wins, you know, maybe you had 20 bucks on the game. Oh, great. That's awesome. But that's a six. Like it's not a 10. And I think too often we're stuck in this zone of comfortable complacency. So rather than thinking about one to 10 in a linear plane, I kind of think of it as a parabola or a pendulum swinging back and forth, which is I've realized to experience the tens, you also need to embrace the ones. You also need to put yourself in challenging circumstances. Um, you know, my my solo crossing Antarctica was a beautiful experience, not because nothing bad happened, but because it was hard and it was gritty and it was tough. And I found myself at the lowest moments of my life, but because I was able to not hedge against that downside one, but embrace those ones, both the ones and the tens can come to life. And I both see them as valuable. So my biggest fear, um, or the way I look at risk is actually my biggest fear is to living stuck in this zone of comfortable complacency from the four and six, you got to have some four and six days. You got to transfer through theirs from time to time, but I want to live the full tapestry of life's experience. And I think that too often in our culture, um, life brings us to that comfortable middle and we don't allow ourselves to take on any sort of risk to allow ourselves to feel those peak moments of those tents. Of all the adventures he's undertaken, the one Colin is presently most known for is his record-setting trip across Antarctica. I asked him to elaborate on what drove him to attempt such a seemingly impossible journey. What I was attempting to do was become the first person in history to complete a solo, so completely alone, unsupported, which means no resupplies of food or fuel. So you have to carry everything with you from your drop-off point to the end, uh, which makes it very heavy. My sled was 375 pounds, uh, mostly full uh, of food and, like I said, a little bit of white gas to be able to melt snow and turn it into water um, and very minimal gear because to, to I mean, still 375 pounds. Uh, I could tell you a whole story. I could barely pull the thing when it started. Um human powered. So, you know, no, no dogs or people have done some amazing crossings of the continent using kites to propel them. Um, but my goal was kind of the most pure mono mono way, just me, my sled, uh, pulling, you know, on foot, you know, wearing skis, but just to, to add, um, not like you're skiing, just to add some, uh, stability over the, the snow. Um, that's called man hauling. And so nobody in history had ever completed that crossing over the landmass of Antarctica people had tried in the past you know a few years before i went a guy named henry worsley tried a very similar crossing and he was out there for 71 days very experienced british explorer he's actually the grand nephew i believe of ernest shackleton or one of the guys from ernest shackleton's crew excuse me and he made it 71 days 100 miles from the finish line of the thing and actually we got a bacterial infection and ultimately died you know another guy attempted the crossing a couple years after that the year before i tried and he made it very experienced british explorer made it 54 days into it and ultimately ran so low on supplies and food that he had to be called to be evacuated so you know people have basically started to say this crossing is impossible. People have tried it. The math just doesn't add up. You can't literally carry enough food with you. If you pack your sled with a thousand pounds of food, obviously you can't pull it. If you don't bring enough food, you're going to run out and you're going to get sick and die or you know, any number of things can happen. And so people said it was impossible. And my wife and I, we, lo we love to name the projects that I do, You know, kind of brand them, but just kind of fun for us. And so we decided to call this project The Impossible First, which is also uh, the name of my New York Times bestselling book, The Impossible First. Um, 
But it wasn't because we were like, oh, people say it's impossible in some cocky way of saying like, oh, but I'm going to prove them wrong. It was literally saying this actually might be impossible. However, I'm willing to try my very best. I'm willing to go out there. And if I fail in 50 days, I still believe there's value in trying something this hard because I'm going to learn something from it. I'm going to grow something from it. I'm going to confront those one days and have those 10 days all around it. Of course, I was hoping to complete it and be successful. And you know, ultimately, I was. But it was far from a gimme. Um, and so the impossible first, that idea is bounded upon like, hey, look, certain things might seem impossible in certain moments, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't try you shouldn't take those first steps and engage that process which is exactly what we did out there so it's, it's interesting I think david goggins uh has said something along the lines of like we we don't make these types of plans for these types of things that we're trying to do while we're in the process and we're suffering right we always make them when we're comfortable whether we're either sitting on the couch or, or whatever it is and, and i'm just curious like when you were dropped off and it's i think it's like minus 80 degrees you got like this 300 plus pound sled uh what, what was the first thought that went through your mind <laughs> Whoa, this is a bad idea. No, um, you know, what's interesting is what kind of ratcheted this up even more was I was racing history, right? You know, I was trying to be the first in history to complete this thing. But as I was departing, I come to find out that there's actually another British explorer of very experienced guys, a special forces or the equivalent of like a Navy SEAL in the US, special forces British guy by the name of Captain Lou Rudd who's announced that he's going to make the exact same attempt as me. And when I say the same same exact, I also mean the same day, which is there's obviously not a lot of logistics in Antarctica. It's like one company that has one plane that can take you to the edge of the continent. And there's a very specific time of year where you could even attempt this crossing, which is during the Antarctic summer where there's 24 hours of daylight. And um, so instead of being minus 100, it's only, you know, a casual minus 30 with a minus 70 windshield. You know, it's warm. This is the summertime. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, Captain Lou and I literally means we were stuffed in a cargo plane shoulder to shoulder looking at each other, no longer just racing history. But this becomes a head to head race, an actual battle, uh, mano y mano. But we he's saying some things to me. He's like, it should be a Brit that cracks this journey first, you know, you know, kind of getting in my head. And I'll be honest, like I'm intimidated. I'm way less experienced than him. He's got the experience in Antarctica. He's this, this badass military guy. And he clearly looks like he's got his shit together. And so we decide, Hey, look, it's going to be too crazy if we get dropped off literally right next to each other. So the plane agrees to drop us one mile apart from each other, equidistant from the first waypoint. But the, uh, the thing about it is, you know, it's that the plane doesn't even take off. It just drops me off and then drives, you know, two minutes over and he pops out. I can just see him right across there. And so I pull out my, uh, you know, minus the minus, you know, 25 minus 30 degree temperatures immediately hit my face. I've got to completely cover up. I can't have any exposed skin or, I'll, you know, I'll get frostbite or whatnot. And I'm loading up my sled for the first time. And, you know, it's 375 pounds. I pull up my little GoPro that I've got there and I try to say, I don't know, probably silly to look back, but something articulate like, this is me, Colin O'Brady on, you know, November 3rd, 2018, taking the first steps of this, you know, historic crossing or whatever. Um, you know, I guess I was trying to pretend that I was Ernest Shackleton from 100 years ago. But then I strap on my sled and you know, I've got like basically this harness. It's like a backpack kind of with a rope connected to the sled. And I try to pull it. And I pull with all my might, all my strength, and I literally can only budge the sled like 50 feet at a time. I've got a thousand miles, nearly a thousand miles to go, and I can't pull my sled. It's just a terrible feeling. And I had just done an interview with the New York Times and the Today Show, and I've just announced, you know, to millions of people. And here I am, like, I can't literally can't move. And so your question was, what did I first think? That was the first thought was like, wow, this is embarrassing. And that embarrassment and fear quickly went to complete devastation. And I started sobbing. I started literally crying, tears streaming down my face. But what happens when you start crying and it's minus 25 degrees outside? Well, the tears, they actually freeze to your face. So now I've got frozen tears on my face. And I think, okay, this, you know, misery loves company. I should look over to my right and see Captain Lou you know, he must be struggling too. you know, that'll make me feel better. And I look over and nope, he's like fully in stride, pulling his sled, disappearing across the horizon. So like, I can't pull my sled. I'm getting smoked in the race. I just told all these people I'm doing this quote unquote impossible thing. So I pick up my satellite phone, kind of uh, thematic, as you can see. And of course I called Jenna and she knows that I've just been dropped off. She's like, why are you calling me? Like you just got dropped off. And I'm like, yeah, well, I think we named our project the right thing. It does appear that uh, this is indeed impossible. 
Um, and she's like, wait, what? And so again, I mean, I think this, this is advice that anyone doing a challenging thing, whether this is building a business, raising a family, setting some goal of achievement, endurance, et cetera, she grounded me in some really solid advice, much like my mother put the chair in front of me and says, you want to race a triathlon, you know, take your first step out of the chair. Jenna asked me, how far are you away from the first waypoint? And I looked down at my GPS. It was a half a mile away. It felt like it was a million miles away and untouchable. She goes, forget about Lou, forget about the nearly thousand miles of frozen icy tundra you have to cross to complete this thing just get to the first waypoint you will at least feel like you made some progress and 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 it it wasn't pretty i mean it took me a very long time you know 100 feet at a time 200 feet at a time dragging this 375 pound sled to set up my tent on that very first day but i made that i made that progress you know i got to that first waypoint and i mentioned it earlier but that was really that point where those demons, those, those negative thoughts were just full in my tent, you know, thick in my tent. I could feel that negativity in my own thoughts. You're an idiot. Why'd you try? This is never going to work. Lou's already kicking your ass. You know, this is embarrassing. Oh my God, you're going to have to go home and face the press, whatever. And that's when I started shouting at the top of my lungs, you are strong, you are capable. And it, it wasn't, look, it wasn't, wasn't pretty from there. And I, and I write about this moment in depth in my book, The Impossible First, but Basically, it was having to let go of the end goal and focus on the present, focus on those incremental steps. You know, it's not like the next day, all of a sudden I had some magic level of energies. I only full day and the second day, I only moved a few miles and a few miles more. But each day I ate a little bit of food. My sled got a little bit lighter. I found my bearing, so to speak. And as you know, I ultimately, I did pass Lou and I did complete this crossing, becoming the first person in history to do it. But it was built on the back of severe doubt right out of the gate, wanting to quit, thinking this was the worst idea, and literal frozen tears on my face to make me feel as pathetic as one could possibly feel in this circumstance. Though Colin struggled throughout his journey across Antarctica, it wasn't for a lack of preparation. I asked him to discuss how he trained for this journey. This was very well thought out. I spent a year in a sports science lab and I created this custom nutrition um, that ultimately we called them the column bars and we're going to come out with a more of a retail product of that uh, next year. But yeah, the nutrition was like as dialed as it could be hundreds, you know, thousands of data points on my blood and my body and this. I'd weighed every single piece of gear. My coach, you mentioned David Goggins uh, before. My coach is a guy named Mike McCastle who actually smashed David Goggins pull up record. Mike McCastle, my coach, he actually did 5,000. 806 pull-ups uh, wearing a 30 pound weight vest i think goggins did like 4030 or something like that um so the dude i'm training with is like you know one of the most badass dudes uh on the planet and he's simulating all sorts of stuff for me we obviously couldn't go to antarctica to train so he's like trying to simulate as best as we can having me pull heavy stuff i um, doing stuff with my mind where he'd have you know my hands would be in frozen ice buckets doing a plank he'd have me hold that till i was out of breath and he'd have me hop out of it you know do a bunch of squats to really jack my heart rate up and then put my feet in ice buckets. And then all of a sudden he would hand me like a Lego puzzle. And he'd be like, you can take your feet out of those ice buckets when you solve this Lego puzzle. And it's like, I'm like, what, what the heck is this, man? He's like, look, your hands are frozen. The dexterity and your mental acuity, you're going to need to have that sharp. At the end of a day, pulling your sled for 12 hours, your hands are going to be frozen. Your mind's going to be foggy, but you tying the ropes on your tents or setting up your tent or getting inside or these things, like those are the difference between life and death. And so we did a year plus of preparation simulation i crossed greenland in preparation a 30-day crossing of the greenland ice cap uh in preparation of this it's not if i just didn't just show up out there but even despite all of that sometimes when things are this far out on the edge um, of possible there's no way to simulate it other than to get out there and problem solve every step of the way which is what ultimately what i had to do and I'm curious, what when you're out there, what what are you thinking about? Because in a way, like you're you're alone with your thoughts, right? What's going through your mind on on in these days, consecutively, day after day? Yeah. So ultimately I was out there for 54 days, completely alone. Antarctica is 24 hours of daylight this time of year, which I mentioned, um, which means it's just white in every single direction. I talk about it as sort of standing inside the belly of a ping pong ball, uh, very disorienting. The sun doesn't move at all. So there's no movement of shadows, basically very small movement of the shadows. Um, And I've got a compass strapped to my chest. So the only way I can tell where I'm going is to basically stare at a compass bearing. I mean, it's like if you closed your eyes and walked down a a dark hallway, you know, you're going to smash into the wall pretty quickly. Humans are not patterned to be able to uh, walk in a straight line without visual cues at all. Um, So that's what it was like 12 hours a day pulling my sled out there. Um, But I actually intentionally 
I said, one of the, the, the scariest things, people always say, how could you possibly be alone for that long, alone with your thoughts? And the initial thing is, oh, you must be bringing a bunch of music with you. You must be trying to distract yourself or whatever. And I actually said to myself, you know, that would be a knee jerk response, but I'm going to try to not avoid that, not try to resist that. I'm actually going to try to embrace that. And so what I did is I actually deleted almost all the content from my phone. I left five of my favorite uh, albums just in case I really needed to hear something. But I spent 98% of the time in complete solitude and in complete silence. And look, that was one of the hardest things that I've ever done. But after the fourth or fifth day, I found these deep flow states in my brain. You know, I, I went into these deep and beautiful places. Oftentimes I would think about memories from childhood, but instead of like, you know, oh, hey, do you remember your high school graduation? And something comes across your face right now, but then we're going to keep talking and forget about it. Like something like that would pop up in my mind and I'd live it like in a vivid dream for, for 30 minutes or an hour or two hours, like a playing back a movie in visceral detail. I could, I could smell the breeze. I could see the fabric of my shirt. I, you know, and I went back through my entire life in these rich, uh, deep ways because of the sort of the, the silence and stillness in my brain. And one of the things that taught me is that it's all in there, man. Stuff you've thought you've forgotten, like it, it, it might be buried deep, but if you ever have the stillness and the silence, um, which very few people take the time for, you know, it's all in there. And also just, you know, I mentioned flow just a second ago, but to expand on that, you know, I found these places inside of my body that were, you know, deeply powerful. You know, the end of this journey, I was within, you know, I woke up on Christmas morning, 2018, and I was 77 miles away from the finish line. Um, and one thing that was was wild was I, I woke up that morning and I was basically out of food. My ribs were sticking out. My hip bones were sticking out. I was completely wrecked physically. I could actually barely pick up my duffel and you know pack it into my sled that morning. And I remember thinking, oh man, I'm in bad shape, such bad shape that actually my wristwatch started sliding down my wrist because I, I didn't even realize you could like lose weight in your wrist. But like, I mean, I was compromised. I was running a more than 3000 calorie deficit every day and it was 50 some days in. And I start walking that day and I think, okay, 77 miles, I'm going like 15 or 20 per day. Maybe it's three big days. I could finally finish this thing, but I'm, I was on, I only had a couple of days of food left. And then all of a sudden I clipped into one of the deepest flow states of this entire process. And I start going and I go inside my body and I start, I start going like, okay, 77 miles. Well, how many hours is that pulling my sled? And I think maybe it's like 40. And then I just make this moment. And so I go, look, I am going to keep walking until I finish this thing. I am not going to stop. And I found, although my body was so weak, I found this place in my mind of absolute focus, of absolute confidence, of absolute strength. And also the passage of time was somewhat distorted. And I ended up making this final push, 33 hours, nonstop, 77 miles, reaching the finish line without stopping. You know, that was a 10. I found this place inside of myself. I had to go through all the ones, all the challenges, all the frozen tears, all the doubts inside of my 10. But I finally found this beautiful place inside my mind, this flow state um, that was just one of the most beautiful experiences of my life and just tapped into the positive energy of love and kindness and compassion and empathy. And ultimately, that brought me uh, to this finish line um, in the silence and the stillness of my mind. And I'm curious, when you reached the finish line, and even throughout this journey, like, was there a point where you you were no longer thinking about Lou? Like at that point, you were just focusing on what you had in front of you or was he still on your mind throughout this whole thing? You know, it's funny. Um, I passed him on the sixth day. So that was the only time I saw him out there. And we had a brief exchange, which was tense. But ultimately, you know, we moved on from there. And about the 40th, every single day, he was actually on my mind a lot. Every single day, I would get up. And I had originally planned to take some breaks, you know, like if it was a really bad storm day, 50 mile per hour in, 60 mile per hour in, say, you know what, too dangerous to go out there. That's common in polar travel. But because Lou was out there, I never took a day off. Um, I never allowed myself because I thought, man, he could just catch up to me in one day. If he's brave enough to go, I have to go. And what's interesting about that is that I realize now the math doesn't work if you take a day off. Like I was on my last day of food when I finished, basically. And so had I taken those few days early on in the expedition, I never would have made it to the finish line, which means that Lou being out there is actually the reason I finished this. And the other thing that's kind of funny is that obviously I've spent a lot of time out there alone, about the 40th day or so, can't remember the exact day, but I keep thinking, 
I keep thinking about this guy that's out there and I'm like, oh, you know, I got to get up. I got to go. I'm in this race, whatever. But I'm like, there's nobody out here. And I literally called Jenna one night from my sat phone and I just say to her and I'm being dead serious. I go, is Lou real? She's like, what? And I'm like, is Lou real? Like, is there a guy out here? Or did I just like make this up in my head to like, I literally couldn't distinguish between reality because it was just I either either he is real or I made him up and it's a really great device for me to continue to push myself out of my body. So I, that's how far out there I was in my brain. But what ended up at the end of the journey, I ended up getting to the finish line a few days ahead of him, you know, and I was proud to be the first. But although this had been a race and although this had been about you know, not only history, but a head to head race and he had kind of been this antagonist for me, this guy that really was intimidating and whatnot. You know, as I got towards the end in the last chapter of my book, it's called Infinite Love because as I pushed through this flow state, what really came to me was love and gratitude um, for, for my family, for my friends and support um, for Lou. You know, ultimately, this person who had been an adversary was like, he brought out the best in me. And although, you know, I was a few days ahead of him and proud to be first, you know, I could have gotten on a called the plane and gotten picked up and gotten out of there and gotten back to a shower. And trust me, I desperately wanted to. I actually only had one pair of underwear with me the entire journey um, to save on weight. So, I mean, a shower would have been nice at that point. Um, but I decided to wait for Lou because I wanted to congratulate him and honor him. Look, there's 7 billion people on this planet. There's one other human being that has any idea what it takes um, to do this. And so, you know, just as proud as I was of my own uh, accomplishment, you know, I was proud of Lou and more than anything, grateful because him being out there brought out the best in me. And we've remained friends. We had a, a, a cup of tea in London uh, not long before COVID. Um, last time I was able to travel to Europe and we both said the same thing to each other, which is like, hey, you know, you brought out the best in me. You know, ne neither of us maybe would have gotten across had it not been for the other person and kind of uh, that. So competition can sort of breed breed uh, the, the best, bring out the best in people in the right ways. Man, like a worthy adversary. Like when you were going through all these different, you know, periods of adversity, like, did you ever think, hey, this is going to make a great story one day or are you just trying to make it through? No, I mean, look, it's funny, you know, throughout the entire crossing, you know, you know, Jen and I have, you know, marketed and branded to some level our projects. And, you know, we we do these things where we we have students, you know, tapped in for our nonprofits. So we have millions of students involved in that. And so it's, you know, we're doing outreach and things like that. But once I go into them, I'm not like, oh wow, who's covering this story or whatnot. And so Jenna had kept me like very insulated from all of that. You know, ultimately, this expedition, which I didn't know at the time, not until I was back in the United States, um, had garnered two billion media impressions. It was the most, you know, widely covered expedition in modern history. And so, you know, kind of a funny tangent story to that was I, fl I finally, after Lou finished, and then it took a week or so to get picked up from where we were back to this other base in Antarctica and ultimately back to the southern tip of South America to Punta Arenas. And Jenna had flown down to meet me there. And I, I rush off the plane. I'm so excited to see her and, you know, jump into each other's arms. It's an incredible reunion. And one of the first things I said to her was like, I'm so excited. We get to go home tomorrow, sleep in our own bed. She'd actually got a puppy um, when we were out there. I can't wait to meet our new puppy, you know, all these things. And she was like, yeah, about that. And I was like, what? And she was like, we're not flying to Portland tomorrow. We're flying to New York City and you're going live on the Today Show like tomorrow morning, um, which again, like humbled, honored, grateful for, you know, all the interest, all the exposure. It, it's been a beautiful and humbling thing. But I've been alone in Antarctica for two months, not talking to anyone. It's completely insulated from this. She's like, you're flying to Manhattan. You're going to be on live television tomorrow. I was like, wait, what? You know, it was a total mind warp, uh, so to speak. But, um, but yeah, you know, look, I think that I love storytelling, you know, and I think that every single person has a beautiful story to tell. And I think as humans, um, we gain inspiration from other people's stories. And, you know, I love sharing my story for that reason, but I love consuming. I love listening to stories. I love listening to other podcasts, movies, books. Uh, you know, I'm an avid reader um, for that reason, because I believe all of us in this crazy thing we call life are experiencing it. And when we share those stories, there's a ripple effect of positivity um, that happens from being inspiration and ultimately lifted up um, by a community of folks uh, that share their stories. And so I don't necessarily do it, quote unquote, for the story. But, uh, you know, I've been humbled with how many people, you know, want to hear me share the story and the success of the book and other projects that I've had. But uh, like I said, humbled by it all, but uh, certainly is not the, uh, the driving force uh, to create a story, so to speak, or to 
manufacture one, just to live fully in my truth. And, and from that, I suppose, uh, it spawned, uh, at least my authentic story of my experience and what I've taken from it. And, and Colin, I mean, your, your story is incredibly inspirational. I know it's impacted millions of people. And, and I wonder, I guess, some, one of the dangers of being so public facing or being out in the open. I know there's been a number of like skeptics or critics that have like challenged some of the things that either you wrote about or your experience, but you were there. Right. And, and when you hear that stuff, what, what is what is your thought? How do you respond to that? Yeah, look, you know, I think we've all heard it. You know, haters are going to hate, right? Nobody was criticizing uh, me, you know, when I was out, you know, sort of just doing my thing. Um, and I think that that's, you know, unfortunately a byproduct of the world that we live in. You know, I think you could be the most positive person on social media or Instagram, but as you know, like there's somebody having a bad day just wants to like lash out as a stranger on the internet. You know, it's disappointing. You know, it's sad when that happens. But at the same time, you know, if you actually have something to say, it might, you might rub one person the wrong way, but that doesn't mean it's not worthy of you of you saying it. And so for me, um, you know, I try to rise above that. I don't think it's super worthwhile to to get into the back and forth, you know, of he said, she said, or this. You know, I can only live in my authentic truth. Continue to put positivity and love and and kindness, you know, out in the world. Shine light on other people's successes. You know, one of the things that that, if at anything, what that has taught me. 99% of people that have reported on me and talked about me have been vastly positive and fact check and whatever. But, you know, there's been the, the one art article here or there that wants to, you know, say something negative or pick it apart. And the one thing that I look at that and I say, you know, that's sad that this is that person's orientation to the world or they feel like they want to lash out. But what it actually reinforces for me is as humans, we sometimes have a hard time celebrating other people's successes. Um, you know, it, it's, it's a weird thing, but it's, it's a very human thing. If you kind of look around, I think if we're all honest with ourselves, there's been a friend or a colleague or someone that got a promotion before I did or whatever. And like, you're kind of like, Oh, that should have been my promotion or I should be on this TV show and not that, you know, whatever that is, you know, in your own life, the criticism I would say in my life has just been fuel and re-anchored me towards positivity. It's been a reaffirming thing to say, Hey, be proud of your successes, but be the first person to congratulate and uplift other people's successes. Because it's a weird thing. Someone sells a company, makes a bunch of money. All of a sudden, instead of being like, dude, you did that. That's incredible. I'm so proud of you. Like amazing. People are like, you know, kind of got their hand out. They're like, oh, that should have been me or whatever. And so for me, um, if nothing else, like I said, it's been fuel to just kind of you know, sit with myself if I ever feel those emotions and be like, no, this is amazing. Celebrate people's successes, lift people up. As, as this human race, you know, we're in such a divisive time in this world. You know, I try to set all that side of stuff away and say, you know, how can we find common ground? How can we love each other? How can we uplift? Um, and that's my orientation to it. And if people are having a bad day and they want to lash out, you know, I don't, I don't have to take that negativity onto me. I can just reflect that back as positivity and love. Even the loudest critics in the world, all I do is shine love back back at them. Man, I, I love it. And, and I would say as, as somebody who's actually out there in the arena showing what's possible, overcoming these obstacles, I mean, it's inspiring to others. I just will say that, you know, although a society seems to love that fall from grace, um, to keep persevering, keep pushing through, it's probably inspiring a lot more people than it's uh, than it's ultimately inspiring envy from. So, so, Colin, as we come to a close, this being the Game Changing Attorney podcast, what does being a game changer mean to you? What does being game changer mean to me? You know, I think for all of us, we have our own truths that we can live in. I just shared a bunch of stories about, you know, frozen continents and mountaintops and things like that. And look, like that that's what I'm passionate about. But I love to ask this question back, which is anyone listening, which is what's your Everest? What's your Everest? I actually, as a little kid, wanted to climb Mount Everest, and I've been fortunate enough to be up there twice. I recently didn't get to share this story on this podcast, but went up there and summited Mount Everest with my wife. wasn't a world record, but we got up standing on the summit of the world together a couple months ago. I just posted a video of it recently on my Instagram. And to me, I'll cherish that moment forever, um, probably more so than any of the world records, because to share that moment with the person I love... But to get back to your question, what's your Everest? You know, that could be entrepreneurship. And in, in this you know, audience, obviously, that's the legal profession. That could be family, um, relationships, art, creativity, podcasting, you know, music. It doesn't really matter. What is your Everest? But being a game changer is 
answering that question for yourself, actually having the strength to ask yourself, what is my Everest? What is the biggest goal that feels kind of far out of reach that I'm afraid to even kind of talk into or take the first steps towards? A game changer not only asks that question, what's your Everest, but answers it and shows up every single day to take one step closer to that summit. I wanna give a huge thank you to Colin O'Brady for taking the time to speak with us today. You know, what particularly resonated for me was when Colin said that we all have reservoirs of untapped potential to achieve extraordinary things particularly when we can shift our mindset towards the positive and choose how we respond in tough situations. You've been listening to the Game Changing Attorney Podcast with me, Michael Mogul. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd really appreciate it if you could share the podcast with at least one other ambitious law firm owner who you believe would benefit. And you know what? Maybe more than one. For more information on our interview with Colin O'Brady, see the show notes for this episode in your podcast app or visit gamechangingattorney.com. And join us next time and we'll be speaking with Professor of Neurosurgery, Founder and Director of the Center for Compassion and Altruism Research and Education at Stanford University School of Medicine, and the best-selling author of Into the Magic Shop, Dr. James Doty. You know, many people think the world is a cruel, horrible place, but it's not. In most situations, people want to be kind, they want to be caring, they want to be helpful, but you have to create the environment to allow for that to happen. That's next time on the Game Changing Attorney Podcast. Mm-hmm.